Welcome to episode 107 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And this time I'm going to talk about Miles Davis's release in 1960, a collaboration with Gil Evans' Sketches of Spain. And a reminder, if you like what I'm doing here and you haven't subscribed yet, please do just click on that little icon in the top right or wait till the end of the video and subscribe then. Thanks a lot. This is the fourth significant collaboration between Miles Davis and Gil Evans, a Canadian composer and arranger dating between the late 40s to 1960. This album was a combination of, on the one hand, Spanish music, both classical and folk, but also Miles' jazz trumpet. This was released in 1960 on the heels of Miles' groundbreaking album from the year before, Kind of Blue, which itself had turned the jazz world upside down by questioning the very basis of the chordal structures used in contemporary jazz. And having taken the whole jazz world in one direction in 1959, Miles takes a complete right turn here and heads off into some kind of Spanish orchestral fusion. The background of this album is basically the story of two people, Miles Davis and Gil Evans. Miles' story is quite well known, I won't dwell on it too long here. He was part of that big wave of musicians which caught the bebop wave in the late 1940s, absolutely central figure in the development of cool jazz, uh, as a hard bop player, and then as we get into the late 1950s and the development of modal jazz. So by 1960, Miles, if not the biggest name in jazz, was one of the biggest names in jazz, and I think arguably was the most vital force in jazz, at least along with Coltrane. His collaborator, Gil Evans, much less well known, born in Toronto, Growing up, his family moved all over Western Canada and the Western United States. He ends up in Stockton, California. He's musically inclined. He gets into the whole big band jazz scene, has his own band, which has some degree of notoriety. They tour around the west of the United States, into the Army in World War II, back out of the Army after the war, and he's living in New York, and he's got a job as an arranger for the Claude Thornhill Orchestra. And this puts him in contact with all kinds of young players who were big fans of what people like Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker were doing in bebop, but they also felt that that music, frenetic and exciting and different as it was, needed to evolve if it was going to channel the musical ideas they had. So there was, if not a society, at least a regular gathering of musicians at Evans' own apartment. In this circle are Charlie Parker himself, Miles Davis, Jerry Mulligan, and out of all this comes a collaboration between Davis and Evans, which gets turned into a series of recordings by the Miles Davis Nonet in the late 1940s in the Capitol. This eventually gets released in 1957 as the famous album Birth of the Cool. Evans and Davis stayed in contact but didn't have much to do with each other musically through the early part of the 1950s. By 1957, Miles is signed to Columbia and George Avakian at Columbia says to him, look, I want you to expand your horizons. Here's a whole bunch of different producers that you could make an album with. Pick one. And one of the people is Evans. Miles remembers very well the positive experience of the Birth of the Cool sessions, and so he chooses to work with Evans. This leads to three albums which basically pair Evans' arrangement and orchestral sensibilities with Miles' trumpet, and those are Miles Ahead, Porgy and Bess, and Sketches of Spain. There is a fourth album from this collaboration, actually, which is called Quiet Nights, which was released well after the fact Miles hated it and got really pissed that it was actually released, and truth be told, it's not particularly good. But the first three albums are significant pieces of Miles' discography. Because Miles is the more famous of the two, these albums all get released essentially as Miles Davis records, but in truth, the collaboration is the key to all three of these. The contributions, if anything, of Evans are more significant than those of Davis. The partnership worked for a couple of reasons. First of all, Evans, although a composer by trade, was much, much better at arranging and simplifying and transforming the works of other composers in ways which were going to be more appealing to the listener, but also fit the circumstances of the recording. And he devoted himself to taking Miles' nascent musical ideas and turning them into something where the whole was greater than the sum of the parts, as it were. Miles highly appreciated what Evans would come up with, and it was unusual for Miles to trust other people's musical instincts more than his own. He would not often talk about music with his collaborators. In fact, you can probably count on the fingers of one hand, Evans, Wayne Shorter are the people that come to mind as people whose musical judgment and taste Miles trusted implicitly. Everybody else kind of got the short end of the stick. Their first two collaborations, Miles Ahead and Porgy and Best, had actually been quite successful, not just commercially, but also with the critics. This one kind of threw the critics for a loop because the first two are directly rooted in an evolution of the jazz canon. This has something to do with jazz, but the something that it has to do with jazz is basically Miles' trumpet. Everything else is classically inspired, folk music inspired, inspired by Spain, which was not one of the wellsprings of the jazz tradition. And so the question comes, is this jazz? 
Of the records that they did together, this one was the most challenging to do. It started off with an idea that Evans had to do the Concerto de Aranjuez by Rodrigo. They ended up focusing just in the second movement, and Evans composes a bit of additional music to complement what was already in Rodrigo's score. At the time, however, both Evans and Davis were broadly interested in Spanish music. Miles' wife at the time had gotten really into flamenco, and she had convinced him to listen to that, and he'd gotten into it too, and he was busy buying up all the flamenco records he could find in New York. Evans, meanwhile, was highly influenced by the recordings made by Alan Lomax, the well-known musicologist who did so much to record American folk music in the 1940s and 1950s, but also went abroad and made recordings of what he termed primitive and folk music in Spain. An album cover which does more to convey the sense of hubris and false permanence that the United States enjoyed in the 1940s and 1950s than maybe any other example. Besides the one movement from the Concerto by Rodrigo, there are four other pieces. One of them is Will o' the Wisp, which is a piece from a ballet score by Faya, and then there are three compositions by Evans. So the rest of the compositions are all based on folk or classical themes which emerge from those recordings and other recordings, but basically from this kind of Spanish vogue that both these guys were going through at the time. Side 1 starts with that famous piece, the adaptation of the second movement of the Concerto de Aranjuez. Begins with the castanets, we already know where we're going, it feels like Spain. Here, initially, Davis is playing the flugelhorn, later on he switches to the trumpet. The music alternates between these pastoral sequences and these wonderful swelling accents, and sometimes really quite sharp introductions of brass. It's a thrilling piece of music. It's a delightful and beautiful piece of music. It's a highly accessible piece of music as well. You don't actually have to be much of a jazz fan or a modern jazz fan to really dig this. Perhaps because it's accessible, it didn't really please the snobs. For the jazz cats, it was too classical, it wasn't jazzy enough. For Rodrigo himself, the original composer, he didn't like what had been done to his work. Miles' response was simply, it's music and I like it. The second and concluding piece on side one is shorter, and it's that little piece from Faya's ballet, El Amor Brujo. This has Miles on mute, blending seamlessly with the orchestra. It seems effortless, and yet you realize it's not, and the arranging skills of Evans are such a key to the success of this music because it's not a simple thing to blend a muted trumpet with an orchestral arrangement and have it sound natural and compelling and they absolutely pull this off here. Side 2 starts with the Pan Piper. Once again you've got that miraculous combination of a muted trumpet and an orchestral arrangement. You have a big room full of musicians sounding like a quartet here. It's really quite something. The next piece is Sayeta. Now this is a composition by Evans which is based on parades that would happen in Spain, still do happen in Spain and lots of other Catholic countries, around the Passion of the Christ. And so at the beginning of the song there is essentially a march happening, and this is the procession moving through town. What would happen in Spain is that the march would stop and then a soloist would sing a spiritual lament of some kind appropriate to the Passion. This part is played by Miles on his trumpet. And so Miles here is basically voicing an imaginary lament and he does this really beautifully. It's a very moving piece of music. The last song in the album is Solea, which is Evans' take on flamenco. And just like the previous song, this requires Davis to extemporize on trumpet to basically replicate the sound of flamenco singing, which of course is passionate and emotional and deeply felt. And this was really challenging. And Miles' own words tell you a lot about how difficult that was. What he said was this, now that was the hardest thing for me to do on Sketches of Spain, to play the parts on the trumpet where someone was supposed to be singing, especially when it was ad-libbed, like most of the time. What made it so hard to do was that I could only do it once or twice. If you do a song like that three or four times, you lose the feeling you want to get there. After we finished working on Sketches of Spain, I didn't have nothing inside of me. I was drained of all emotion, and I didn't want to hear that music after I got through playing all that hard shit. Gil said, let's go listen to the tapes. I said, you go listen to the tapes. I think Miles' playing here is totally inspired. It is equal to what he did in the previous song. I'm not as wowed by the arrangement here. I think it gets a little big bandy. But overall, the passion which they were trying to convey comes through so very clearly. And for two guys who were basically flipping through folk and classical Spanish records and decided to pull together a Spanish album, the enormity of what they achieved here is basically breathtaking. And then they put it down and never did this again. Miles was constantly taking left or right or hairpin turns in his career. The work he did with the Nonette and Birth of the Cool, the modal jazz revolution with Kind of Blue, the electric phase, which 
both attracted new fans to his music and also repelled his old fans as he got to the late 1960s with In a Silent Way and Bitches Brew. All of those were basically Miles changing the course of his own musical river. This, to extend the metaphor, is much more of a side eddy or a little pond off to the side. It's absolutely beautiful, but he would never return to it again. Is it jazz? It's not necessarily jazz. Does it matter that it's not jazz? It's too jazzy to be classical. It's ambient and beautiful. It's rewarding every single time you listen to it. The only real shame is that this was the last of the collaborations between these two very gifted musicians. And for me, it's four and a half out of five stars.